Thank you. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be back here, and thank you for the invite for presenting. So I'm going to talk about the uh, Minerva Direct Fourier Conversion Project. Um, and the presentation is in two parts. The first is to just do an overview of what Direct Fourier Conversion is, for those of you who haven't come across it before. And then the second part will be progress and where we're currently at at the moment with the project. So most of today's uh, SDRs that use uh, direct down conversion uh, use this type of architecture. So you have your antenna connected to some form of filtering an attenuator, which may be necessary if you've got strong local signals, preamplification, and then directly connected to the analog to digital converter. Once you're in the digital mode, you then move into um, doing all, all the rest of your processing in the digital uh, domain. And typically it's done in either a, an FPGA, which is typical for the open HPSDR projects, or it could be in an ASIC, and there's ASICs coming out now which will implement all of this uh, in a chip, which you don't have to program. So the first thing you do, I'm sorry? No? Is that better? OK. Um, so the first thing that happens is you want to create your in-phase and quadrature signals. You do that with a complex mixer. You then want to decimate the um, speed of the data coming out of the complex mixer. And that's typically done with a CIC filter, followed by a compensating fear filter. Two identical channels, one for your in-phase, one for your quadrature signal. Then into an interface to get the data out to your PC. And for OpenHPSDR, we use uh, an Ethernet PHY, either running at 100 base T or a protocol 2 where they're running at a gigabit. For transmit, your INQ data comes from your PC over the Ethernet, um, is fed to uh, in-phase and quadrature, CIC interpolating filters, and then into a complex mixer to mix the baseband um, uh, INQ signal here out to the frequency you want to transmit. It's fed to the input to the digital analog converter, low pass filtered, and out to your preamplifier. And this is pretty standard for most of the current um, digital up and digital down converter uh, SDRs that are being used at the moment. Now, you can take this to the extreme, and that is don't send your data over Ethernet to a PC, but put the processing of the PC inside the box. And you end up with this type of transceiver. So we've got the new Yesu. Um, transceiver here and one of the icon ones and that's really the extreme no pc required everything's in one box and all the processing is done locally the other extreme yeah. you're not screwing it into my head are you uh, yeah okay okay <laughs> okay okay yeah. oh, thank you um the other alternative is is to do absolutely nothing in uh, hardware uh, in terms of digital signal processing whatsoever. So move every single bit of digital signal processing out of hardware and put it into the PC. So we've gone from the extreme of putting the PC inside the box and doing, doing the processing in an FPGA and in your PC. And the other extreme is to have as little hardware as possible. And the minimum hardware we can build an SDR with is to have three components, and that is an analog to digital converter, a digital analog converter for transmit, a common clock, which is needed to clock the, these two devices, and then some form of interface to connect to our PC. Now, this data is coming out typically at 16 bits at 122 megs, and the data coming in is coming in in, say, 14 to 16 bits at 122 megs. So we've got a very high-speed um, uh, bus required to connect this data directly to our PC. But fortunately, there's plenty of options. PCs nowadays are designed to take high-speed data, and we have um, a, a uh, interface on most modern PCs called PCIe. And these uh, are slots on your motherboard where you can plug boards in, and they're designed to take parallel data at very high speed. A number of options for PCIe. The first one is the very first uh, generation of PCIe, which was called One Lane Gen 1. And the marketing team decided this would work at 2.5 gigs. In fact, in practice, it runs at about 1.6, primarily because they do 8-bit to 10-bit encoding, which takes some overhead. And secondly, there's packets that need to be put around the, the packet that's being sent to your PC, and that drops the data rate down. So although that the brochures tell you um, 2.5 gigs, in practice, you get 1.6. Um, the next one, the next generation, was called One Lane Gen 2, which took us up to 3.2 gigabits per second. And then, at the moment, we've got four lanes at Gen 2, which takes us at 12.8 gigabits per second. We've got lots of bandwidth and lots of speed from our hardware to get in and out of the PC. That's not a problem. 
So it's possible that with a fast modern PC, so a quad 3.8 gigahertz PC CPU, we could process this mass of data coming in in, uh, in real time in the time domain. And we could implement multiple digital down converters in software. <coughs> However, if we did that, because of the sheer volume of data we're having to transfer, there's not going to be much CPU left to run other software. And ideally, we'd like to do our software-defined radio and then run other projects just as, as John's been showing. So we can use a different architecture. And we're using part of this architecture already, and that is that in, in our PC, we currently do filtering in the frequency domain. Um, we use finite impulse response filters. And we could do that in the time domain, but above a certain size of fear filter, it's much more efficient to take the Fourier transform, do the processing in the frequency domain, and then convert, convert back into the time domain. So doing filtering in the frequency domain is not something uncommon. Most of the radios out there at the moment, and the PC software we have already does that. However, moving back, moving into the frequency domain, taking the FFT and back again using the inverse FFT is moderately CPU intensive. In which case, if we move back, if we move into the frequency domain, we'd like to stay there as long as possible rather than have to do the inverse FFT. And direct Fourier conversion, DFC, does most of the DSP in the frequency domain. Um, I've called this process direct Fourier conversion. It's not new, it's been around since the late 1970s, some of the first papers I could found, but I couldn't find a consistent name. For want of a decent name, I've called it DFC. So that's, uh, I'm, the, I'm to blame if you see it in the, on the internet. That's where DFC came from. I couldn't think of another name. So DFC does most signal signal processing in the frequency domain. And when for receive, for a digital down converter, we need to do three things. The first is we need to do frequency translation. So we need to select the frequency band we want to receive. We then need to band filter to just select the, f the signals we're interested in. And then finally, we need to decimate to bring it down to a sampling rate which we can manage, say, which is suitable for doing audio demodulation or for digital mode demodulation. We can also use um, direct Fourier conversion in the reverse process and do digital up conversion to make a transmitter using the same process. And it's just the reverse. So we start off with fairly low data sample rate data, which could be audio or it could be digital data. We then interpolate up to a higher sampling rate. We filter at the higher sampling rate, and then we do a frequency translation to take that baseband data out to the RF frequency we want to generate. Um, this is a block diagram of a simplified block diagram of the overall DFC protest. So we start at the input here with our analog signal, which is fed into the input of our analog to digital converter. The output from our analog to digital converter are digital discrete samples at discrete intervals in time, typically in the 100, 122.88 is the sampling rate we use for open HBSDR. We then need to take the FFT of this uh, data, and we're looking at a fairly large FFT. We're looking at probably about a million point FFT, so it's a quite a large FFT. And we need to use a process uh, to do that FFT because we are taking blocks of sample, we don't have enough memory or enough processing to continuously process all the data coming from the ADC. We have to break it into discrete blocks of data, process a block, do the next one, do the next one. And we can't do that without causing a, a few aliasing problems. And we use a technique called overlap and save, which takes some of the samples from the previous block and adds it to the beginning of the current block. Um, it's, that's well covered in the textbooks and on the internet, so I won't cover that process at the moment, but it's a necessary evil to, to take us to the next stage. So out of the FFT, we're going to have a number of, of bins, and somewhere in those bins, as FFT bins, will be the signal of interest. We want to translate that into the center of the, the FFT, around about the zero hertz point, so we can filter it. And it's a very simple process. We simply rotate the bins. Uh, we shift them so that this signal of interest now exists in the center of the FFT, around about zero hertz. So rotation of FFT bins in the frequency domain is the same as doing a frequency translation in the time domain. So rather than in the time domain, we'd have a mixer, we'd have a local oscillator, and that would do a translation. To do frequency translation in the frequency domain, very simple, we simply do a rotation. Okay, so we've now got our signal of interest at the center of our FFT, and we want to filter it. And we use exactly the same filtering process in the frequency domain as we do today. And that is, we generate the field filter coefficients. 
we take the FFT of them and we multiply the FFT of our fear field coefficients with our, the um, FFT bins. Exactly what we're doing today. Now, the next thing we want to do is to do decimation. In the time domain of decimation, we throw samples away. In the frequency domain, we, derive, we divide our FFT bins into equal length blocks at the decimation rate we want to do, and we add them all together. Very quick, easy, simple process. We can then, if we want to, do an inverse FFT to take us back into the time domain. Because we've used this overlap and save process, we're going to have some aliasing errors in the first few samples of the t in the time domain, so we chuck those away. And what we've left with now is the wanted signal filtered back into the time domain. Unfortunately, there's a problem here, in that is, I think fairly obviously, we can only rotate our FFT bins in frequencies which are multiples of the FFT bin size. So our FFT bin size is, say, 5 hertz. We can only frequency shift in 5 hertz. That would be ideal. It's still not accurate because we want to be perhaps within a one hertz band, a one hertz frequency resolution. The process of doing overlap and save here uh, adds another complication, and that we can't shift in uh, FFT bin widths. We have to shift in FFT bin widths multiplied by the length of the FFT multiplied by the length of divided by the length of our field filter coefficients. So that could be a thousand times. So we may be rather than sifting shifting in 5 hertz steps here minimum, we may be shifting in 5 kilohertz ship, ship steps. So tuning across the band in 5 kilohertz steps is not going to be acceptable. So we do a second frequency translation, and we can typically do that in the, um, in the time domain here. Um, that brings us back now to the frequency we want to be accurately. And if we want to, um, depending on the modulation we want to demodulate, we can do a, a second decimation, just as we do in the time domain now with our current SDRs. This process here, which is taking the FFT of the data coming from the um, ADC, is the most CPU intensive. We're doing a million point FFT, so quite obviously this takes a lot of processing power. And if we want to mo create multiple receivers, what we can do is just do this once, We've got the FFT of the entire spectrum. That could be from you know, 10 kilohertz up to 30 megs. And we can keep that data and use it multiple times. So we do the, F the large FFT at the beginning, and then the rotate, filter, decimate, and frequency translation, we can do multiple times on, on that same block of data, which is exactly what uh, Andras, thank you very much. If Andras is here, produce these beautiful diagrams and let me use them. So we have um, one FFT here. We have the rotates, which is doing the frequency translation multiple times. We do our filtering, inverse FFT, and there's our, in this case, three receivers. But as you'll see in a moment, we can have many, many more receivers. We're not limited to uh, a small number like seven, John. Okay. Right. Eight receivers. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we can also do the same process I mentioned in reverse to make a transmitter that uses this process. And the steps are... We start typically with our audio data uh, sampled at 48 kilo samples per second, and that can be either voice or it can be uh, digital data for uh, one of the digital modes. The next thing we need to do is to do frequency translation because later on down the process, we have to shift in fairly coarse frequency steps, which may be, say, 5 kilohertz steps. So in order to hit the frequency we want, we're going to have to take our baseband frequency and shift it within a 5 kilohertz, five kilohertz block to make sure we can get on the exactly on the frequency we want to transmit on. So we need to convert to our DAC sampling rate, which is, in the case of HPSDR, 12880 kilo samples per second. But the FFT size, to be a most efficient, has to be a power of 2. So unfortunately, 122880 divided by 48 is not 2 to the n. So the first thing we do is to interpolate from 48 kilosamples per second to 480 kilosamples per second, which is a quick and simple process. We now have a division of 256, which is 2 to the 8, so we can use an optimal FFT to, for the transmitter. We then uh, pass it through uh, fil fear filters, just so we don't receive. We do our frequency translate again by simply rotating our FFT bins to bin the bring the signal we want to the frequency we require. We do um, an inverse FFT, we're now back in the time domain, and that's the time domain data we put into the input of our digital analog converter to go into transmit. 
So, just to summarise, this is what we've got now in terms of hardware. All we've got is an ADC, is a, an ADC on our circuit board, a common clock for the transmit and receive, and some form of interface to our PC. The hardware interface inside the uh, hardware, the connection to the PCI interface is extremely simple. The PCI interface, which I've been using, is actually built into the FPGA in hardware. No coding required whatsoever. So you simply have certain connections you have to make, certain setups you have to do to the hardware, but all that work of creating a PCI interface has been done for us. The only thing we have to do is we've got different clock speeds here. We've got our ADC data coming directly from the analog digital converter. It's being clocked at the sampling rate, typically 122.88 megs. <coughs> but the connection to the PCIe is typically running at 125 megahertz. We've got a different clock rate here and here. So we simply put the data from the ADC into a FIFO, clock it in. When the data, that the data that on the output of the FIFO has reached the size of a packet necessary to the PCI interface, the PCI interface is, issues a read command and clocks it out at its, its speed. Very simple, few lines of code. On transmit, we have a similar process. We've got our um, DAC data coming in over the PCI interface. That's coming in, coming in here from the PCI interface, being clocked out at the PCIe clock rate, um, which isn't going to be the same as our DAC clock rate. So we put it into a FIFO at the input, we then clock the data out of the FIFO at the DAC clock rate, 122.88 megs, and that data um, physically is connected to the input of our digital analog converter. And once again, no, no coding here, a library coding for the FPGA here, and probably 10 to 20 lines of code. So very, very simple, and a very small FPGA, and very cheap. Um, in terms of what does this look like at the PC side? So at the PC, we've got we want to look at two um, FIFOs. The two FIFOs are um, this one here, which is slash in under Linux, which is slash dev SDR ADC, and it looks like a file, like everything else does under Linux. You read that date, you read from that file, it looks like a regular um, Linux file, just never gets an end of file character because you're just continually streaming data. To send our data out to the digital analog converter, we write to a file slash dev SDR slash DAC. And this PCI interface is actually built into the latest version of Ubuntu. So there's no coding to do. It's actually been incorporated in Ubuntu automatically. Under, um, under Windows, um, these two uh, um, FIFOs look like a pipeline device. So a very similar process. Now, we could do the processing in the CPU, as I mentioned earlier, but you can use an awful lot of CPU. The other alternative is, is to use the GPUs in a graphics card. And I've been using this NVIDIA GTX uh, 1050 Ti, which runs at about just under $200 US and contains 768 um, CUDA cores. So plenty of processing power available at a very low cost. You need a graphics card in your PC anyway, so why not use one which you can use to do SDR work on? Alternatively, um, we can use one of these little NVIDIA Jetson single board computers, which um, ran at $192 and 192 CUDA cores. And I have one of the boards here, which we'll be demonstrating at lunchtime running, actually running this code. Unfortunately, uh, this stopped being produced in April this year, so I hope you've bought yours well in advance. Good, okay, that's good to see. So for pure signal, um, one of the challenges is going to be how we're going to implement pure signal. The way pure signal works at the moment is we take an output sample from our power amplifier, it goes into our ADC through a digital down converter and then off to the PC to be processed and brought down into baseband. We take a sample of the data which is being fed to the DAC, the actual input to the DAC, feed it through exactly the same process as the RF signal, goes into the PC and these two signals are compared and then Warren works his magic, creates the, P the I and Q data that's being fed to the DAC and Bob's your uncle, we get wonderful IMD. Um, so under um, direct free conversion, we don't have any of these, this, these processes. We have our RF samples, which is going to go into the PCIe interface and will eventually be demodulated to give us our recovered um, the data. But on transmit, we're transmitting the actual DAC input data, not, um, and there's no f facility in here to feed back that data, and we don't want to if we can. So I'm hoping that because we've already got this data in the PC, 
then there's no necessary no need to, to transmit it anyway because it's already there. So we can do a digital down conversion in the PC to marry the data that's coming from the RF sample. The requirement is that these two interfaces work in time step. Phase differences is not too important, but we can't have a, fa a time difference between the data we're feeding back from the RF sample and the data we're the recovered and uh, processed data we're feeding into the, the DAC. So that is a bit of a challenge. But looking at what people are doing over PCI interfaces, having multiple boards to form beam forming arrays, etc., it looks pretty hopeful because if they can do that, then we can do this for, for, for a Power SDR. In terms of development, if people want to get involved, I've written FPGA code for all the OpenHP SDR boards, right from the Hermes board up to the, um, the current NN8000 board or Orion 2 board. Basically, the FPGA code just takes raw ADC samples, 16 bits, that's 61.44 mega samples per second over a gigabit Ethernet, We're using raw Ethernet frames. Raw Ethernet frames have the smallest packet overhead we can the smallest packet overhead to get the data into the PC as fast as we can. And we make the, um, the packet sizes a multiple of 2 to the n, because we can then get it into the uh, FFT quickly. We haven't got to repackage it, and we need a 2 to the n ratio FFT to be as efficient as possible. Um, this is the DFC prototype that um, John wrote, wrote for me. It uh, uses the Jetson board. Uh, we'll have a demonstration running here at lunchtime, which we can show, but basically it takes direct data from an ADC, processes it on the jet Jetson board, uses the CUDA cores on the Jetson board, and it appears like a Hermes board. So you plug this board in, plug it into your PC, and John will show at lunchtime, it appears and works just like a normal Hermes board, but there is no hardware DSP processing being done whatsoever. It's all being done on the CUDA cores inside the, 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 the card. This is using um, uh, regular power SDR. Um, okay, I think fortunately, I'm unfortunately, it looks like I'm running out of time. Um, I'll run through very quick the slides because my slides will be available. This is from work that from Steve um, AD0S did. He's written a lot of Linux code that supports direct for conversion. Um, basically, this code called uh, Athena, um, it provides a raw rhythmic communications link between the SDR hardware and the PC. And um, it basically does the um, FP, the um, FFT conversion work for you. The next bit of uh, software he wrote enables you to se select up to 80 digital down converters. And then each of these down converters um, is fed into a server. The server then allows you to connect to a client, and we've got clients here of QT Radio, uh, FL Digi, WSJTX, to enable you to run over the internet and connect wonderful things like John's QT radio here to connect to any of the, one of those 80 digital down converters. So summing up, um, this is the Minerva DFC prototype board. Uh, it has an ADC, a DAC, clock, PCIe. This was one of the early prototypes. I have another prototype which arrived on Tuesday morning and I left on Wednesday morning. So apart from putting a bit of power on and checking those smoke came out, this is as far as I got unfortunately, but hopefully we'll have a working board available. Um, so finally, thanks Vasily, John, Steve, Warren, Andras, and Bernd. And uh, if we've got any quick couple of minutes for questions, I'll happy to take them. Thank you very much. Phil, Phil, do you know why disappeared the links to the Athena project from Steve's website? Some days. Some I weeks ago, yeah. just disappeared. I know, John, uh, John and I had the same discussion, and I don't know why the links are down. <laughs> yeah. I wrote the slides, and then I was going to put the URL on the bottom of the slide, and I went to see it, and his site's down for some reason. But yes, I, I saw you were using quite long FFTs, about 1 million points. Uh, does it make any sense to use sparse FFTs to actually, because you only need a small piece of the, the result? Well, you could do, but you really want to, if you want to have multiple people connected to your receiver, you really want to have the whole of the, the, the shortwave band. So one of the projects we have is for the local radio club. So we can have a multi-coupler, put all the antennas into here, and then people at home can, can connect to one of 80 receivers, and everybody can be on a different frequency running a different mode. So looking at sli uh, slide eight, um, that's where we, you, you describe the, the overlap at yes. um, um, filter, and then you describe, you basically alias the um, different parts of the um, point-wise multiplied 
filter. Why don't do the aliasing before doing the point-wise multiplication? You save on multiplications. Um. And also, you like, yeah, okay, yeah, you, that's the main point. You save on multiplications, wouldn't you? Yeah, but you you need to. Um, you can't alias before you. You can't uh, de um, decimate before you've filtered. You have to you filter can. before. Uh, you yes, you can because that's like you're adding up as a linear operation, right? Okay. So let's, let's yeah, take, yeah, let's take it as a linear step. Okay. Okay. Um, also, like yep. the FFT size, you said needs to be a power of two, which is m kind of makes sense in hardware, right? Yes. So why not simply go from 2560 to 4096 by using the appropriate amount of padding that you need to add later on? Anyway? Well, if you're doing the time domain, you could. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I see the point. But we want to be in the frequency domain. <laughs> yes? Is there any advantage in uh, phase noise? No. There no. 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 The phase noise is generally generated by the, the clock and the performance of the ADC, which is outside what we're doing here. Yeah. Yes, but in, uh, usually um, averaging helps, helps to reduce phase noise. Can you please no. use the microphone? It, it, won't, it won't make any difference whether you're doing this in the frequency or the time domain. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. One, one last question. What, what is the typical amount of overlap of these time samples? Um, so I don't quite understand. Frequency the frequency samples? Yes, the, 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 the t time samples that you use oh, for... Oh, sorry, um, a time sample takes six, six, comes in every 16 milliseconds, and we can process one complete DDC um, down to a baseband in four milliseconds. Oh, that's on a Jetson board? Um, so there's four cores on the Jetson board, and we're using only one core and about half the CUDA cores. So timing is not an issue. 16 milliseconds per block of ADC samples and then four milliseconds to do the entire process. So plenty of time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.